morning, everyone. It's so nice to see you all again. Um, I joined you in June, and um, I let you know that Gary and I bonded at seminary. We both graduated from Wesley Theological Seminary, uh, and I especially uh, gave Gary the brownie points for being the only man in my women in the in the letters of Paul class, <laughs> and we bonded there. Um, so it's a joy and an honor to be here with you all again this morning. Thank you so much for having me. Our scripture readings this morning come from Psalms 42 verses 1 through 3, and then John chapter 4 verses 5 through 15. If you want to follow along with me as I go through, you can find the passages on page 514 in your Old Testament Bible and page 94 of your New Testament, or by following along on the slides. Psalm 42, verses 1 through 3. As a deer longs for flowing streams, so my soul longs for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God for the living God. When shall I come and behold the face of God? My tears have been my food day and night, while people say to me continually, where is your God? Gospel of John chapter four, verses five through 15. So he came to a Samaritan city called Sychar near the plot of ground that Jacob gave his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria. For Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have no bucket and the well is deep. Where do you get this living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well and with his sons and his flock drank from it? Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The story of the woman at the well brings me back to Israel in 2019. I went with a group of seminarians for an immersion trip where we studied the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. One of our stops was at the well where church tradition says this story took place. While we don't have proof, of course, that this is the same well, there's no reason to doubt it. Archaeologists, in fact, say it's the only well anywhere in the vicinity dating back to such ancient times. Today, there is a beautiful church built above this well, but it's not a common tourist stop because it's way out of the way of anything else. To get to Samaria, you wind very slowly up an extremely steep mountain with narrow roads and hairpin turns. To make matters worse, we were in a bus. It was scary enough to look out the window at the cavernous drop-off that seemed to invite us to careen to our deaths. But when the giant bus went around these nearly 180 degree turns, I was terrified. At some point with several prayers offered, and I'll be honest, probably a few cursed words muttered too, 
I decided I wasn't even going to look anymore. I turned my body away from the deadly view just outside my window to my seatmate and told her she needed to keep me in conversation until this story ended one way or another. Jesus climbed this steep mountain too, one step at a time. Just before this, Jesus was in Judea. It says he started back to Galilee Depending where in Judea he was when he started out, that walk ranged anywhere from 35 to 70 miles, a journey of at least a couple of days. The text says he had to go through Samaria. In the Gospel of John, this phrase, had to, is usually interpreted as God's plan. And indeed, there was another way to get there, because Jews and Samaritans were such bitter enemies, most Jews usually took a longer route through barren land to bypass Samaria when going between the two towns, but not Jesus. In fact, in the Gospels, Jesus rebukes his disciples for their hostility towards Samaritans, heals a Samaritan leper, honors a Samaritan for his neighborliness, and praises a Samaritan for his gratitude. In Acts, Jesus tells his disciples to witness there. So here's Jesus. Out in the middle of nowhere, hot, sandy, and parched, in the territory of enemies. The references to Jacob's well not only underline the patriarchal culture in which this scene takes place, but also conjure up biblical stories with marital undertones and similar settings. For Isaac in Genesis and also for his son Jacob, this is the third wedding imagery we have in the Gospel of John and we're only in chapter four. Jesus is reworking that imagery into stories about the end of days. Stories that deepen our understanding of the joy and fulfillment offered to us forever. And this story does more of that reframing. So Jesus' disciples are basically out on a Chipotle run. It says they're getting food and Jesus is sitting here alone until the woman comes around noon. The common interpretation claims she went in the heat of the day to avoid other women who would have chosen cooler times to carry out this chore. A small and temporary escape from the repeated sting of judgment and rejection. Because after this bit of text, we learn that she's had five husbands, and the man she's with now is not her husband. Maybe she does have some sort of social anxiety and goes to lengths to avoid others instead of face the fear of what they may think of her and the associated knot that creates in one's stomach. That part could be real, perhaps. But the truth is, we don't know the circumstances that led to these marriages. People died young back then and men married older. She could have been stuck in the ancient custom of having to marry a man's brother after he dies, which there's even a parable about in the Gospels. Maybe she's not yet married to the next brother. Maybe there are other circumstances that are not explained. We don't know. While we are intrigued, Our human judgments often cloud our interpretations. And really, Jesus seems much more concerned with showing her who he is and connecting with her than in judging her. He asks for a drink. This is the true scandal of the story. First, Jews were repulsed by Samaritans. There's a social status gap between the two, and elite Jews would not have degraded themselves in addressing a Samaritan, let alone request or accept hospitality from one. To ask for water means Jesus is willing to make himself unclean by touching something the woman has touched. On top of the enemy issue, this is a woman. Men did not initiate conversation with unknown women. 
And a teacher definitely did not engage in public conversation with one because remember, people could see these two out their windows from a distance. It would be fodder for town gossip that they were talking. So Jesus is violating all kinds of conventions here, as he likes to do. He's bestowing honor and dignity upon the loathed. The woman is stunned. She's like, how can you speak to me? How in the world can you ask me for a drink? Jesus' response invites another question. If you knew, he says, if you knew who I am and the gift of God before you, you'd set aside all the proprieties and speak to me too. You would actually ask me for water. A dramatic shift would take place. I have special water, living water. She's confused. Sir, you don't even have a bucket. You're not making any sense. And by the way, one of the great fathers of both our faiths gave us this well. Jacob's is one story that actually unites Jews and Samaritans. Are you greater than Jacob? She basically says, you'll need a miracle to prove that to me, like Jacob got when he met his wife here. And Jesus is like, Jacob's miracle was legendary, but it was not permanent. My water is a different kind of life source. I have water that actually quenches that emptiness inside of you, that void that the world can never really fill, no matter how many promises it makes or how many husbands you get. What I offer is the key to life abundant. It starts with knowing God, who offers the spirit even to women, Samaritans, and outcasts. A God who says that society's lies, where beauty and riches and status matter most, most and death appears to be the end, those are all distorted messages. God shows us the truth versus the lies in the world, and we can now sift through them with the clarity of the Holy Spirit. Your value and your worth is not based on your performance, not the failures of your past, or even those of your present and future. We are no longer defined by anyone else's approval of us. And indeed, once this woman knows Jesus, even if she was avoiding others before, she later in the chapter seeks out the crowd to tell them all about this special man and the living water he offers, because that's what now matters most. God's love and acceptance is so different. You are met where you are and loved exactly as you are, without limit. It's a relationship, a spring of water, Jesus says here, gushing up into eternal life. Eternal life in the Gospel of John is so much more than literal eternal existence, though it is also that. At its heart, eternal life emphasizes the quality of life we experience here and now. That doesn't mean believers don't still go through pain and hard times. We do. In many ways, following God is so much harder. Because the Messiah doesn't look like power and might and war and conquest, like the world would have you think. The Messiah, who Jesus declares himself to be later in this conversation with this very woman, looks like a parched and haggard, worn out homeless wanderer who depends on people the world says not to touch or even speak to. 
Jesus quenches our thirst for life by answering what that life means, who we are and why it matters, that brings eternal life. Eternal life promises a transformation of our spirit, the way we look at everything. It changes our heart, which in turn changes the compass and the purpose of our life. We now see God and others with whole new eyes, and that changes how we relate to everyone and everything around us. We are infused with a holy love, a love that bubbles up in us and overflows all around us, a love that accepts people for exactly who they are, a love that offers our time, our attention, and gifts to all of creation. Drinking divine water results in freedom. Freedom to understand. Freedom to join. Freedom to pour into others, no matter who they are or what society says about them. It's freedom to live authentically in a way that we can be proud of. Freedom to offer peace, inclusion, and community. Freedom to accept, serve, and commit. Freedom to hope, unite, and find contentment. It's freedom to love without limits, which brings us a taste of heaven today, together. The water of the spirit is clear. It's flowing. We can drink it right now and enjoy that drink for all of eternity. I'm drinking the living water that changes everything. And I invite you to join me. Cheers. Let us pray. Lord, we come to you parched and haggard. It's not lost on us that tomorrow marks 22 years since the September 11th attacks on our country, reminding us just how very broken our world is. And so are we. Please quench our thirst with your everlasting spirit Guide us and fill us so full that we overflow and pour out your everlasting waters into the lives of those around us. So that we may break the cycles of evil and shine your light as a healing balm to the pain around us. We ask these things in your great and all powerful name. Amen.